Ladies and gentlemen, we're privileged to have with us this evening Bobby Slayton. Hello, Robert. It's been a while. You know, first of all, yeah. uh, you think you're fooling anybody with that background? It looks great. I know. But it's, yeah, terrific. It's, not... it's terrific. See, I mean, I can go, and there you go. See, it oh, really? Oh, Are you... Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But it looks cool, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny because since this whole COVID thing, mm-hmm. um, you know, once it started, you know, I got a million calls. Um, and you can imagine if I was famous, how famous people must yeah, you know all these all these podcasts were contacting me they obviously contacted everybody because everybody was stuck in their home and you know and i, I can't tell you so i do all these podcasts and uh, i'd see the list of people that had done them i said well if this guy did it that guy did it well sure i should do it what i have nothing else to do i'll do the podcast right exactly and I, not not one thing on facebook not one thing on twitter i don't know if anybody didn't watch it anybody doesn't give a shit nobody responded anyway the whole point was and then i realized after a while I have nothing to plug. I'm not working. What do I? I don't well, have a book well, out. Why are you doing? It? Yeah. Yeah. Huh? yeah. See, there was no reason for me to do all these podcasts. But I always love the fact that almost every one of them. Hey, we're contacting comedians because we want to know what you're doing during COVID. Have you read any COVID jokes? Everything was about COVID and Trump, and I was tired of talking about COVID or Trump. Yeah. And even thinking about it. So, and then it was like, well, you can plug something, and then I again, like, I had nothing to plug, and then they always say, look, it's you'll have a lot of fun, and right there was what I said, no, I don't, I don't want to have fun. No, we play like a little game. No, we do like a little game. We play it. It's, it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's like a little game show with comedians. We talk topical stuff. And I don't want to play a game. I don't want to be on your show. And my, is there a chance of me winning a car? You know, is it like, let's make a deal where I can get a, a new a refrigerator? There's no point in me doing this. But anyway, the point being that when you called, yeah. I can't say no to Alex Bennett. No, not of course that, not. You know, you can't. No, because we go back because so far. Because if and, you and, and, say no to Alex Bennett, your career is finished. Well, maybe <laughs> I'm trying to think when I said no to you and when it was finished. I want to see if, they, if there's if, if if there's a correlation there to when it was finished and when I said no to you. I don't think I ever said no to you, but um, never said no. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I was looking through some uh, pictures the other day. You know, boxes and boxes of photographs when people use cameras, and you know, I, I I came across those shots of us on the sleigh ride in Lake Tahoe when I married my wife. The Donner, the Donner wedding, how freezing it was. None yes, the, the Don- I called it the Donner wedding party. It was, it, it was, it was an extraordinary weekend because I know we've talked about this before, but well, when you I decided, decided to marry my you wife, decided that you wanted to get married because it was romantic in right. a, a sled out in the middle of a field right. uh, during really cold weather in Lake Tahoe. But wait, but it, yeah, but it was, and I'm not embellishing here. It was more than that. We originally wanted to get married. In Paris, because I think my friend Greg Kinn had got married in Paris. And yeah. Somebody said they got married under the Eiffel Tower. But the red tape that you had to go through at the time, what if you had to be in Paris for 30 days? You had to get this. And I said, you know what? It's not worth the aggravation. And I more than the romantic idea of being in Paris and mm-hmm. under the Eiffel Tower was the fact that, you know, n- we didn't have to invite our family and friends. Oh, we'd like right. to come, but we don't want to go to Paris. Yeah, okay, right, we'll exactly. Invited, yeah. Exactly. You know, I didn't, I didn't need like China or any kind. I didn't need to register at Macy's for any kind of gift. So I figured we'd go there, nobody would show up. So anyway, I was playing in Lake Tahoe at Caesars Tahoe. Mm-hmm. And right next to Caesars was a big open field. Yeah. And while I was up there for the week playing this comedy club, I decided I'll call my wife. She should come up. Oh, she was coming up anyway. We should get married. You know, she was pregnant with my daughter. And I figured, well, we might as well just get married. Just like we said, you know, it's like she said, you want to have an abortion? I go, no, let's have the baby. Yeah, let's get married. It wasn't like we gave any of this, any thought. Mm-hmm. So it's snowing outside. I look out my window and I see this big field and they give sleigh rides. And I went over and I talked to them. They go, yeah, you can get married on a sleigh ride. We fit like eight people. No, it was, it was bigger than that. This was like a huge sleigh. This could fit like about 15, uh, 16 people. Well, I, you know what? Let me look at the picture. Yeah. I, maybe you're yeah. right. I, don't, you know, I just saw the picture. Yesterday, but there were a lot of people on the sled you know, getting pulled by, by two horses. So I, we have, I invited a few of our friends up. I invited you, of course. We invited a few people. Uh, my, my manager at the time invited herself up. A few other people invited themselves. But anyway, mm-hmm. I figured we'd be... We'd, I'm doing three shows that night, but we'll get married during the day on the sleigh ride. So literally, and I'm not making this up because I went back and I looked at the weather. The day after, we should we can get married like three days after I, I, I called everybody. Mm-hmm. So the following day, it goes from freezing out to like 75 degrees. I look out my window, and this is before anybody knew about you know global warming and climate change. This is going on back then. 
this, this, we'll go back 35 years ago. I look in my window and this field, there's no more snow, it's mud. You know, <laughs> it is now, it has gone from the Don Way to Valley Forge. It's some soldiers with bayonets trudging through the dirt and the mud. Anyway, it was horrible. Everybody comes up, and I don't know how this happened, but the next day, it starts a snowstorm again. It goes from snow to 70 degrees, mud, to one of the coldest storms and freezing, icy. Oh, my God. And that's when we went out on that sleigh ride, and it wasn't cold. You well, you know, was, you know how bad that was. You know how cold it was? I brought a video camera to videotape right. your wedding. Right, right. My camera froze, literally right. froze. That. It would not work like, under like 32 degrees or something in right. those days. And it froze, and uh, I never had any video of it. Well, you got to remember that, um, um, you know, guys like us, we're like, you know, New Yorker, Chicago people, you maybe not, you know, you, you've lived through some cold winters, so it's not like we didn't experience cold. It's not like we just flew in from Bora Bora where we grew up. You yeah. know, we knew cold, and this was mind-boggling. They did videotape it. I, I think I have a video because I think that it was Reverend Love. That was his Reverend name. Love. Yes. Love. Remember that? Yes. Yes. It was a love chapel. I'm it's sure it. not his real name. I. You know what? I I asked him. He said it was, but who knows? You know. Now here's I, something. I, yeah. Here's something. It just hit me, and I didn't think about it. Guess where I got married? God. You tell which marriage? The this third, one. Fourth, the, fifth, sixth? the eighth. Yeah. No. This one. Yeah, no. This current one. Oh. To Marjorie. Now, where did you get married? Lake Tahoe. You did? Yes. How long ago? Oh, this was about uh, about, 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 about 2010, yeah. I think. You don't remember, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Where, and, where, and, and, where, and, in, where in Tahoe did you get married? One of the we, got, we got married on the North Shore. Okay, well, yeah. much nicer. Yeah, yeah. I think the Love Chapel, the last time I was up there, and it's been five years. Yeah. Was still there, yeah. You know they were still giving sleigh rides, yeah. And um, you know Caesar's Tahoe now is some you know corporate. Not that it wasn't corporate before, but yeah, a right. faceless right. stone edifice. But it didn't have. You know I remember I remember one of the jokes I used to do. You would walk through the lobby of Caesar's, yeah, and they'd have those big statues of you know whoever the Greek you know or the Roman gods were, you know. Yeah. And, you know, peeing in a pond with lily pads, <laughs> you know, these naked, uncircumcised phalluses peeing yeah. in a pool. And I remember them telling me the first time yeah. I opened up for Kenny Loggins, you know, you should really work clean. I go, really? You got a giant statue of Zeus or whatever the fuck he is peeing in a pool as soon as you walk in here. And I, I can't use a four letter word, but seeing a big naked guy. Yeah, you, you got to work. You got to work clean, huh? Yeah, yeah you right. got to work clean. Right. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. It's pretty funny. Memories, mm. huh? Memories. Memories. Yeah, that was uh, that was a nice weekend though. That was a nice weekend. I was glad I, I, you called me and you said I'm getting married this weekend. Can you come up? And I came up, and a whole bunch of other people came up, and uh, we were all there for a very special moment in your life. Well, that's when you could fly into Tahoe. That's when you could buy a ticket the same day. You have to buy three weeks in advance and fly on a Thursday and stay seven days. Come back on a Wednesday. You know, so everybody just got a ticket for like twenty nine dollars from uh, from L A or San Francisco. That's you know. Yeah. When you could fly to Tahoe, you go over that mountain, you thought you were going to die. Yeah. But well, um, well, we knew you. We knew you and, and your temperament and so on. And of course, we were all saying to each other, ain't going to last. Right. <laughs> right. This yeah. marriage ain't, it ain't going to last. Because you met her. She was walking across the street, wasn't she? No, 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 no. Teddy, no, that's how she died. Oh, oh, by the, the way, by the way, let me tell yeah. people this. So yeah. the Reverend Love is doing the, you know, the nuptial. Oh, yeah, I know what you're going to say. Go ahead. I know yeah. the story you're going to tell. He right? says, um, <laughs> Bobby, Teddy. Now, which one's Bobby and which one's Teddy? Right, right. right. <laughs> I remember that. I remember that. I remember very well. Yeah, yeah. I remember them saying, you promise to cherish but, but, more than anything. And, yeah. You know, you get... He, he wonder if we want to write our wedding vows, and I said, just just make it, you know, not, as non corny as you can, but just make it quick. And, yeah. And then and then we were supposed to go on a whole tour of, you know, the the, the valley there the and the, the, the hills, pasture. and we yeah. were freezing yeah. our asses yeah. off. Just let's get married again. Yes. And, and Caesar's was nice enough. They gave me a suite for the night, a big giant suite. And they supplied food and wine, yeah. and then we all went out to dinner. You know, I think the whole wedding cost me like three grand. So wedding, and we all had a great time. Yeah, had the no, best it's champagne. Wonderful. Everything was great. It, it, but, to uh, this day, it, it is one of the more memorable moments of my life. How's that? Well, I did three shows that night. But anyway, how did how did, how did you meet her? I thought you wrote uh, my business manager Gary, and you said yeah. I just met the woman I'm going to marry. And it I was, met it, her, and I don't think yeah, you even no, no. knew her. 
no, no, no. I was playing at the Ice House in Pasadena. Yeah. And um, a bunch of friends, mutual friends, mm -hmm. brought her to the show. She was by herself. She was gorgeous. Yeah. Know? And when I saw her, I kind of fell in love with her right away. I mean, she was, yeah, you remember Teddy. She was, I mean, drop dead gorgeous. And um, yeah. really, really smart, very funny, and great designer. But anyway, she, um, I asked her out. We went out. And I guess I made a little bit of a scene. I, she was very, very shy. And she said she wouldn't go out with me again because I was, you know, being an idiot. I had two glasses of wine. I, you know, do yeah, whatever. Yeah, I, I don't even remember what I'm doing. You're always an idiot. But, go ahead. Yeah, anyway, always. Yeah. But I guess yeah. Yeah, to her, she's not used to. Well, she kind of didn't behavior. realize that it's what you do as your profession is being an idiot. Being an, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And Jerry Lewis has always said, you know, he's, that's that was always been a line of Jerry Lewis's. He said something, and I'm paraphrasing. You know, I make a living from acting like an idiot, which, you know, nobody encapsulizes that better than Jerry Lewis. But yeah. so anyway, she said, I'm not going out with you again, but come over, you can come over for dinner and I'm going to make you dinner. And I went over to her house a week later and she had made me this chicken that has to brine in, in, in ice and lemon for like seven days. It was literally fall off the bone. Mm -hmm. You know, chicken's chicken, but it's the best chicken I've ever had. Yeah. It took her, we got married, it took her like eight years to make me that chicken again. I go on the road, she said, what do you want for dinner? And I, go, I want that chicken, you know, and it would always take seven <laughs> days and she was busy. She was working. I was working. And she made it yeah. and it just didn't come out the same. She only brined it for five days and it wasn't wow. as good. Wow. I got to see if I can find that recipe so I can make it for my girlfriend now. But um, anyway, so that was a great yeah. story that went nowhere. Yeah. But, no, I but, but, but they, they, we, we all said, hey, you know, Bobby, it's not going to last. You know, it lasted well until your wife passed. How many years? I think we were together a couple of years before that. You know, it's mind-boggling to me because you know as well as I do because you're a tad older than I am, but you think back to, I think about this all the time, you know, about, you know, she'd been gone five years this past April, March, five years she'd been gone, and I've been with my girlfriend now almost five years. But you know what it's like, you know, you start starting about when you were at the Quake, and, what, 25 years ago, and you, you think back, and, you know, it's so cliched, but when your parents told you, and your uncle told you, and your friends told you, oh, it goes by really quickly, you know? Mm -hmm. It does. It's like, it's like that John Lennon line, life happens, you know, while you're waiting for life to happen, you yeah. know? It yeah, just, no, it's yeah. true, it's true. But the thing is that, uh, that, she, um, um, that you met your new girlfriend, because no, her, her husband had recently died, so you both had the same experience. Well, what was really interesting, and I'm tired of telling the story, she doesn't really like, well, I don't, I think she's used to me telling people because it's, it's, it's horrible, but beautiful. It's fascinating. My, uh, my girlfriend, um, her husband was a major Hollywood producer yeah. and manager. Yeah. And I knew him for many, okay, for, uh, since I was, he was a comic. major, he was a major player, a major guy. And yeah. I, I, I knew him from when I was a doorman at the now defunct famous uh, boarding house in San Francisco. I must've been 20, 21 years old. Anyway, yeah. I knew the guy for a long, 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 long time. And he managed a lot of people, but for some reason, and I'm very proud of this, I was his favorite comic. And he handled a lot of comedians, big time guys. And he loved me, he come see me all the time. But you know, when you always say to people, hey, we'll get together. But you know what, when I'm on the road, and well, wait he's a minute, working, did he ever manage, he, did, wait a minute, did he, he loved you, but did he ever manage you? My manager, Sherry Marsh, went with his company oh, for like I see. Okay. six months to a year. Yeah, he tried to do a few things for me, but he was really had his hands full with all these other people, and it never worked out yeah. for whatever yeah. reason. Yeah. But what was really interesting is, that, like I said, I, I always want to get together with him. We should have lunch sometime. And again, so, hey, we'll have lunch. But you know what? When I was on the road, almost three weeks out of the month, I come home, packing, unpacking, packing, unpacking. You know, I want to see my kid. I want to take my kid to school. I want to take my kid to Disneyland. I want to have dinner with my wife. You know, you know, and then he's busy and he's working on a picture. So finally, you know, we got together um, about four or five months before he passed away. I didn't realize that he lived literally five minutes from me. In L.A., that's like next to our neighbors. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, New York, you can take a subway to the village and be there, you know, in no time. But, you know, in L.A., to drive from the valley where I live to Santa Monica or whatever. Yeah. But he literally lived five minutes away. And right between our two homes is a beautiful little shopping center with a couple of great little restaurants and great little nightclubs. So we met up there at a sushi bar. And I go, I didn't realize you lived five minutes from me. Meanwhile, he died five months later. And uh, they had a big service for him. And his widow, who I never met, she didn't like the whole showbiz thing. She never came out to the clubs and right. wasn't really part of that. She had her own business. So 
she uh, she invited me to the service, and it was really nice. A lot of people showed up, and you know, Billy Crystal got up to spoke, and Rob Reiner. I'm trying to remember John Lovitz and Martin Short, and Mike Binder, and uh, oh, three or four of the luminaries, and mm. it was you know it was big. And she puts me on at the end. I mean, what, what do you have to put me on the end for? I got to follow Lovitz and this guy. And that yeah. guy. You, you, you were my husband's favorite comic, so so I got to close the show now. And you know, anyway, um, she invited me back to the house. You know, the Jews. Mm-hmm. You sit there, you have a little meal, and then my wife dies. You know, we have to get hit by a car in Mexico, literally three months later and I called her up and I said we're having a little party celebration of her life at my house Mm -hmm. and she couldn't make it I was on the road she was on the road same kind of we're both busy on the road yeah right And we finally go in August this is four or five months after my wife died I take it to Rayo's restaurant you Mm -hmm. know the famous Rayo's in New York they had an outpost here but here's a funny story she said to me when she met her husband she didn't realize he was a big macha big producer right and their first date they went to the palm and you know, have all the caricatures on the wall of all the celebrities and the regulars, right, you know, right, the caricatures. Right, right, right. So sort of like the Hirschfeld looking, whoever does the artwork. Yeah. So they're sitting underneath his, his caricature. Mm-hmm. And she goes, who is this guy? And we're going to a restaurant. We're sitting underneath his picture, you know, and she found the kind of funny people coming up and kissing his ring like he was a godfather. So um, I take it to Rayo's and I didn't tell her. I made sure that they put me in a booth in the back underneath my picture. <laughs> and I said, you know, that was really weird about your late husband that he had to sit under his picture. But you know, a lot of guys in showbiz were like that because I can't go to a restaurant unless I'm sitting under my picture. And she didn't know. So she looked up and there was my picture sitting above us. She didn't know it was there. Yeah. So it's kind of it was yeah. pretty funny. But it's, the, pretty funny. It, it's, it's interesting that, that you you met each other and and connected because you did have something in common. You know, well, you, a lot of people go, you know, a lot of people do that, the rebound thing. Yeah. You find somebody right away. It's like when your dog dies, you got to go out and get another dog to try to replace the dog. Um, it's similar. I, I'm not comparing wives well, but to dogs. But this is not Bobby. Bobby, a rebound yeah. is something you do, and then you go on to the next one. This right. wasn't a rebound because this thing's been last has lasted for five years now. Well, what's funny is after our first date, I went back. My brother was sleeping on my couch, yeah. and I said, "I just met the woman. I, I think I fell in love." He goes, "Your wife's been gone five months." And uh, and I would call my girlfriend, Dominique, and I would say to her, you know, um, I'm, I'm in love with you. She thought I was insane. Um, but I took her out four or five more times, and now it's... Uh, but here's the thing. She still lives in that house five minutes from me. She just left right yeah. before you and I yeah. uh, did this, uh, did, did our little interview thing. So, I, I, I like, every weekend, I either spend at her house or she spends at my house. But you know something? I know people who have done that. And their relationships have lasted much longer than if they were living under the same roof. Well, I love my house. You know, my wife, you've never been to my home, but my wife did a great job with it. And slowly, I haven't man-caved it, you know. Right. There's no, right. but there's a few more monsters and a few less flower pictures. <laughs> there's a few more, you know, I know skulls I know. On, my, on, on, my, on top of my sock drawer where there was maybe, a, you know, a, a whatever she had, you yeah. know. And um, so slowly, you know, the, the cleaning people now have a beautiful collection of, of plates and, and vases. And my daughter <laughs> took what she could. Goodwill. I've kept yeah. them alive for the last yeah. uh, five yeah. years. Give me, you know, my wife collected a lot of girly stuff, nice stuff. But so anyway, I have my house. She has our house. We go back and forth. Uh, Monday, yeah. Tuesday, we split so I can have, you know, the food I want, my spaghetti meatballs, my cheeseburgers, yeah. things she doesn't like. And then, so it's, yeah. it's a great relationship. Um, the way we obviously, have it, it obviously. just worked out. And I met her. She's a lovely, lovely woman. And, yeah. uh, you know, if you ever lose her, it's your fault. Anyway, right. Uh, right. I want to ask you something. You, uh, when we first set this up, you said to me, well, I don't normally do these interviews, but for you, Alex, you know, and of course, then I'm yeah. appreciative and then I'm owed uh-huh. to you for the rest of my life, you know. Uh-huh. And right. then you said, I, you know, I'm really, I'm retired. I'm not a comedian. I'm not in the business anymore. Are you right. really not in the business anymore? Well, it's sort of like, you can't fire me, I quit. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of like, um, yeah, yeah. well, you know, look, Quentin Tarantino calls, or, you know, Scorsese calls, anybody calls. You know, I, I, I would, You're happy Woody to- Allen calls me again, yeah, of course I'm gonna do a movie. Um, okay, so first of all, since COVID, everybody was kind of semi-retired. Right. You know, everybody was forced to retire. So what happened was, look, look, I, I was getting sick of stand-up comedy. I did it as long or longer than anybody. 
you know, is, you know, there's guys in this business that have done stand up for 40, 50 years. You know, Carlin was one of them. Seinfeld's one of them. Rickles. Bill Barr's one Rickles. Of them. And then Rickles. And they kept doing it. They kept doing it. And they didn't. I, not, I, I'm sure none of them needed to do it or needs to do it. You know, but you watch Bill Maher's show and every weekend or every few days, every time he's off, he's still back on the road. Um, before COVID, it was, he'd always say at the end of the show, next week I'll be here. Next, he'd go all over the country. Right, right. Seinfeld, okay, they love it. And maybe right. if I was making that kind of money and had those kind of fans, mm -hmm. I would love it too. But here's the thing, <clears throat> 40 plus years, maybe 45, yeah, yeah. that'd be the plus. Yeah. 40 some years of playing, you know, some yuck yucks in Columbus, Ohio or whatever, and getting up in the morning and flying in a day early to do morning radio where I've got to be driven by some waitress who wants to be a doctor and sitting in traffic to do some hip hop station where nobody, none of those people are going to come see my show anyway and doing the top 40 station with the soccer moms and then doing two shows that night, having a horrible opening comic and who's working really blue. And, 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 and you, you, you know, I mean, look, there's some great comedy club and it made a great living. It was fun for a while, mm -hmm. but it's a young man's game. Um, you know, Buddy Hackett, Don Rickles, all those, you know, those well, guys by the time by, by the time they reached that age, they were working right. like the big rooms in in exactly. Vegas, okay, which exactly. is different than working some stupid comedy club in Des Moines. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And 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 to be honest with you, that you know, there, there's a whole generation of new comics now, mm -hmm. and and social media comics. You know, it's like a lot of people. You know, you can't get a book deal. People have said unless you have, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, publishers. Look, do you have a half a million, you know, followers on Twitter? You, are you big on social media? Do you have a TikTok account? Yeah, I don't like any of that stuff. It, it doesn't, you know, the Twitter thing, I, I even stopped well, doing that also, once in a while. Also, I, Bobby, Bobby, yeah. I got to ask you, this is a very important question. Yeah. Your act, how do it play today in the Me Too era? Okay, first of all, I don't know because, okay, that's, yeah. okay, I was, I was getting to that actually. Yeah. The other, okay, uh, but the other thing was, is that now, Look, there's a lot of comics. Some are good, some are uh, actually uh, awful. I try to watch all these Netflix specials and usually can't get through more than 10 minutes. Yeah. There's a lot of really funny comics. Uh, I don't want to say, uh, sound like this whole fart. Oh, the comics today, they all suck. You know, like Milton Burl used to say that about my generation of comics. They're dirty, they're not yeah. funny, we did this. But I watch a lot of stuff that's been rehashed, that's been done, not that they stole it, but you know, you see all this stuff, comics do it, you're smoking pot, your parents come in and go, what is this, Cheech and Chong, 1971? I, I think they did that. And any, anyway, so much stuff has been done, but it, you know, there's a new generation of viewers and millennials and people that are watching comedy on their on their iPad. Or uh, anyway, my generation and our generation, because you're certainly a little bit older than I, we're not going to comedy clubs. You're not going out. You know, if you want to watch comedy, you're probably as sick of it as I am. You can turn on Netflix and see a million people on your big screen TV, and people. Well, it's not the same as being in a club. Really, with some asshole next to you is talking, with his valet parking, where you can't drive because you've been drinking, because <laughs> there's a bachelorette yeah, party, a bunch of drunken exactly. cunts, because the drinks suck, because the hamburger's cold, because the food sucks. What do I need to do that for when I can watch it in my home, fall, fall asleep, make some popcorn, watch the rest tomorrow? So anyway, my, my audience was either dying, going away, or, and I was getting tired of flying. You know, if I was Bill Maher and Jerry Seinfeld, you're flying on private jets, yeah, but right. you're flying coach, and your flight is canceled, you're on a Holiday Inn Express, in the middle of nowhere, it was getting old. Yeah, and now, what's interesting is you say, well, at least you got all those air miles, but the last thing you want to do when you're not working is get on a goddamn airplane. I've been on a plane in two years, and uh, me and my girlfriend are going to Mexico in the fall, but that'd be fine. It's a two-hour flight. We're going on vacation. But yeah. but anyway, the, the point being that I'm, I'm, I'm just too tired of doing all these clubs. And now with COVID uh, hopefully going away, all these clubs are opening up again. So there's dozens and dozens of comics who sell more tickets than I do. You mm. know, some of them funny, some of them not, but whatever. Clubs don't care. They, they sell tickets. So the clubs are backed up with people they need to give gigs to. So when you ask me if I was retired, yeah, I don't want to go back to the clubs. It's kind of like, no it's kind of like I'm retired. Okay. Right. I don't want to be. I, you know, I would like to be plying my trade other than on some lousy internet show. Right. Right. Uh, some uh, lousy washed up comics like Bobby Slate. Well, like yeah, the, 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 uh, we could call this yeah. the washed up hour here. Anyway, yeah, right. uh, that's actually great. Yeah. But um, well, but what I'm saying is is that 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 uh, we are 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 kind of doing what we're doing because not because we want to, but because that's the way things are right now. My what I did, the radio I did, doesn't exist anymore. Okay, okay. well that's the one thing too. I know a lot of radio people who've told me the same thing. 
Yeah. Um, and it, 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 it does relate to comedy. I let's see. I don't want to do stand up anymore. I'm sick of it. I haven't written a joke. I mean, every once in a while, I think of a great line that I used to do, a mm-hmm. great line, and I throw them in a little shoebox I have here. That if I ever go back to do a show, <clears throat> you know, here's some stuff I want to try. Here's some stuff that I used to do. Um, but um, like I said, the clubs, my money went down tremendously. It's not even worth doing anymore. Mm-hmm. And right now. I have enough money to live off for, for a few years. I don't know what I'm going to do in a few years. And I'm doing some radio commercials. Skechers hired me to do a lot of radio spots for them. So that's paying some bills. Now, you know, I'm, I'm sending my daughter back to college at 33. She's going to school. So, I mean, you know, uh, you know, it's, I, I'm not, I, I, yeah, I'd like to be making more money. If somebody calls me and puts me in a movie, I'll do it. I don't want to read for a sitcom. I don't want to be on a sitcom. I actually, you know... One of my biggest fears, I always had a major problem, and I don't know how guys do it, and it could be maybe I have ADD, or the drugs I did, maybe I'm not as bright as I thought I was, but I always have a hard time memorizing a half-hour sitcom. I've yeah, done, yeah. you know, a yeah, dozen I understand where you're, I, I, I'm the same way, although I did... I can't memorize a lot. I did learn how to memorize when I was doing... Uh, uh, some stuff for Channel 7, and I did these pieces, and right. I had to memorize them. And after a while, I got used to learning that don't put the pressure on you to memorize the line. Right. Uh, understand what the line is supposed to be. Okay. Right. I, I get that. Yeah. I've got to a million acting coaches who explain that to yeah. me. Yeah. It, 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 it's really hard for me. And when you do a sitcom, look, it's, it's a half hour show, which means it's only about 20 minutes yeah. when you think about it. And then there's you're not in every scene. So it's really only 10 or 15 minutes of stuff to learn. So you're going on a Monday, and by Wednesday, Thursday, they're changing the script, they're updating the script, they're revamping the script, you're shooting Friday in front of a live audience. It always made me crazy. And um, I guess if you are to show week after week, like Seinfeld or whoever, you know, you get, your brain starts to work that way. You know, Kevin Pollack always yeah. amazed me because he's on that uh, Mrs. Maisel, and Kevin had these, you know, some nice big monologues and some nice big scenes. And since the show, was I guess developed and created by playwrights. They want they want their lines exactly word for word. 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 Yeah, right. I've been very lucky. In some of the movies I've done, and I, I've done like maybe 15, 20 movies. <laughs> Only one or two minutes. In each well, no, what I was going to say is the latest film you did for Woody Allen, which I saw, right. which is uh, right. called I'm, Something's Festival. I can't remember the film uh, name R- Rifkin's Festival. Rifkin's right. Festival. Right. Uh, you only have one line. Well, yeah. But did he, you? Uh, and my question is, did you blow it? No, okay. Uh, no, I blew Woody. That's how I got the part. Get out, you see? I still got it, Alex. <laughs> he kept meeting there. <laughs> um, no, but you know what it is? Um, but over the years, what's great about doing movies, if you work for a guy, I've always been very, very lucky that, that I worked for some great directors, and you could ad lib all your stuff. When I worked for Barry Levinson and Bandits, he let me make up, me and Bruce Willis and Billy Bob Thornton, we did a few scenes, yeah. and we kind of made up everything as we went along. Barry goes, do another scene, because Barry was a stand-up comic. And when I worked with Robert England on a show called Nightmare Cafe, it was directed by Wes Craven. That wasn't a live studio audience, so we could go up, and he said, do whatever you want. And when I worked with Amy Heckerly, you know, mm-hmm. Fast Times at Ridgemont High director, she's always let me ad-lib. Anyway, and Woody, I worked for three, four times, always lets you ad-lib lines. And so I've been very lucky. But that last movie, I told you the other day when I talked to you that he flew me to Spain, to do one line in a movie because he likes me. Um, um, I don't know people think, well, a lot of people don't want to work for Woody now because of these bullshit allegations, which I don't even want to get into. But no, that's, read his they're, book, bu- they're bullshit. They're bullshit. You no, know, they're totally bullshit. If yeah. you watch, I, I could watch that show on HBO. HBO should be embarrassed that they even showed that. But When I'm is somebody just going to come out and say, Mia Farrow's a fucking nutcase? Well, everybody has. Yeah. Uh, they have. A million people have. I don't know the woman, uh, but a million people have, including her son Moses who is a child psychologist. But anyway, I don't want yeah, to get into all yeah, yeah. But I've known Woody for a long time. Not that well. But um, um, but if you read his book, apropos of nothing, it's, it's yeah. it, not only does he well, address Also, he's thing. been very decent to you. He used you in his it's series. Great. You know, he's yeah. used you in a yeah. couple of his films. Wonder Wheel was one of them. Right. Latest right. one is this one. Yeah. You know, I, I'll tell you, but this is why one reason that I'm, and then we'll, I, I, do, I do want to address that thing you asked me about the political correctness of Me Too movement, but yeah. when Woody put me, I knew him for years. And we by have by the way, again. I want to say to everybody, this interview is going longer than any interview we do, and uh, we'll go to our panel after this is through, but to our panel who might be watching, 
fuck you. I got this. I got a great interview. Well, you know what? Here. By the way, I, I see I get all dressed up. I'm going to garden. I do my gardening after this. I said, I wonder if I should put on a regular shirt for Alex. I said, it's yeah. 100 degrees yeah. here. Yeah. I'm going in my backyard to garden. This Why? is fine. You don't get dressed and, up. Why and, should I? And, oh, I don't know. You have people waiting to talk. But, and, so here, this, this no, is the, interesting. They, 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 can, they can wait. This is. Yeah, you people can wait. Come yeah. on. I'm fascinated. Yeah, this, I don't um, get to talk yeah. to Bobby that often. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, you could have broken this up into 10 interviews, did like a miniseries. Yeah, I um, could. I was thinking of telling you, well, why don't we stop and then we'll start and do another one. Yeah, instead of watching one long show that nobody's looking at, why don't you do a whole series that nobody will watch? Yeah, uh, right. But with all due respect <laughs> to your imaginary viewers. Um, anyway, but here was one fear that I had. Okay. Woody Allen I knew for years. And um, not, not really well, but we would have dinners mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And when you talk to comics, having dinner with Woody Allen, it's like, I don't know, <clears throat> Steven Spielberg, the certain people in the business are just giants that you want to talk to. It's like if you're in the music, you know, having their Mick Jagger or somebody that you grew up with and watched. And, you I'll know, tell you, though, I, I, I don't know if I would have very many questions to ask uh, Steven Spielberg, but I would never end with the questions I would want to ask Woody Allen. Yeah, but here's yeah. the thing. When I did it with Woody for the first time, it was over at a friend's house. Yeah. We don't have to mention who the friend is, yes. please. <laughs> let's but, not. Uh, no, please. Please, let's not go into that. That's a whole other. No, please. I don't want to talk about that. Um, just for what he's saying. But anyway, yeah. um, we're having dinner, and uh, he told me Woody Allen was coming over to his house. He want to come over for dinner. I go, well, who's coming over? He says, well, Woody and his wife. I go, who else? Just Woody and his wife. So he invites me over, and I'm thinking, I'm going to sit there with Woody Allen. I'm certainly not going to talk about his film. Oh, you know what movie I love? But I know that he was a big... A tremendous jazz fan, more Dixieland than anything. Right. And I love the blues, and it was a big right. crossover thing, so right. I knew right. we could talk about music. Yeah. And I knew we loved the, you know, sports. I was a big Yankee fan. I knew he was more into basketball than the Knicks, but I knew there was something there. Yeah, and I yeah. knew that he loved Harold Lloyd and Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin. And we could talk about that, which we did. And you know, he'd lead, o he'd lead over you know, to Soon Yi, who's a sweetheart, and he'd go, uh, you know, Harpo was the one that didn't talk. You know, it's, you try to keep her to the conversation, you know, you know, uh, but it was really Harold Lloyd. You know, he did his own stunts and she, you know, yeah. not that she even cared, yeah. but anyway, we were talking and talking and then it turned out what we really, he knew my ex manager very well. Cause my ex, ma not my ex manager, my, my, my friend who passed away, yeah. Larry, yeah. who, uh, <clears throat> yeah. his company managed Woody. Yeah. <laughs> so we had a lot of mutual friends. And when I started doing stand-up in San Francisco, even though Woody's a New Yorker, of course he worked the Hungry Eye and he worked the uh, Purple Onion. So we all had these mutual friends like Mort Saul, like Tommy Smothers, and mm -hmm. David Brenner. And so we, we could talk comedy. We knew, you know, Enrico Banducci, who ran Enrico's. And we, so we sat there talking for three hours. And, you know, I get up to pee like three times because I'm drinking wine. And the only other person drinking at the table is, is Woody. And Woody has like three or four beers. And after this three-hour dinner, which went by so quickly, we had so much fun. At the end of dinner, I said to Woody, you know, he's a very quiet, very nice guy. You know, he never did the Woody character until we were leaving. And I said, you know, Woody, and pardon my impression here. I said, Woody, I can't believe at your age or my age, we're sitting there drinking, you had three, four beers. You never once got up to pee. He goes, that's one of my great attributes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> But if you read his book, he has lines in there. What was the last time you read a book that you actually laugh out loud from reading a, the written word? Uh, you I'm know? trying to remember. There was one, but I can't remember what it was. You can read books. You can read Dorothy Parker, S.J. Perlman, and you'll see the old, these quotes of really fa funny people. Or, or Fanny Price yeah. said this, or Georgia Johnson. But you don't really laugh out loud. Right. When you're right. reading Woody's book, you see it in his voice. I'm telling you, you got to get it. Let's, get, let's get back to this whole thing about the Me Too movement and where okay. your act would fit in all of this. Because it, it, all of a sudden, the kind of things we found funny aren't f considered funny anymore. Oh, that's not right to do. That's not right to say. You know? Right. right. Uh, um, you couldn't do any of the wife jokes you used to do. You know? Okay. Well, here was a problem that I did have. And this goes back before the Me Too movement and before COVID. When my wife died, a good 60 to 70% of my act was about my wife. Not necessarily about her, but about, you know, and a lot of stuff's become cliched now. You know, it's mm -hmm. almost, because everybody's done these kind of jokes. It would take my wife a long time to get ready or, or, or you know, whatever my jokes were. And with her not alive anymore, I couldn't do the joke. Henny Youngman was different. Take my wife, please. He did those long after she died. 
but those were just silly jokes. My You're, stuff right. was more personal and then, you know, serious, yeah. serious, but right. it was more, uh, more personal and, 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 and relevant and real. But so anyway, that part of my act was out. And then, you know, a lot of my act, I was just getting tired of doing, you know, when, when, and then when Trump came in to become president, I actually, and I think I used to do a joke about this, I started feeling sorry, or I felt more, instead of making fun of Mexicans, I was more on their side. And then, um, yeah. and you know, yeah. on women's side. I mean, I, I, I still like to make fun of that whole Me Too movement, but when assholes like Harvey Weinstein came out and, and Jeffrey Epstein came out, I was like, well, you know, it's hard to make fun of women now because now I see their plight a little more. Now my wife is gone. Now these poor Mexicans, you know, they, oh, they're all rapists and thieves. Fuck you, Trump. So. I, I, a lot of my jokes I didn't want to do anymore. You yeah, know what I mean? You did do the gay a lot. jokes. When I started yeah. doing gay jokes, I was one of the first guys to do them. And the way, the reason I started doing them so much was in San Francisco when I was a young comic. I remember a club having a gay comedy night, and over in Oakland there was a black comedy night, and they would make fun of straight people and white people, which is fine. You know, white people do this. I got white people. I mean, and then the gays, yeah. you know, straight people. You know, but when I made fun of them. Because I'm, you know, I'm the majority here. I can't make fun of them. Fuck you. Make fun, make fun of me. It's fine. Do all the Jew jokes you want, all the white men jokes. So, but don't tell me I can't make fun of you. There was no end of the no end of the amount you of. You remember ch- this whole? Remember, uh, most there was of the no gay end, people were it, fine. They they were, a, well, well, what I always was bothered by, I was always bothered by Chris Rock. Always goes, you know, the funny thing about white people, you know, and I go, well, wait a minute. If I did that about blacks, he would just vilify me. Yeah, but then you know. he did his famous. I like I like black people. I hate niggas. So once he did that, you know that put him back. You know, it's Chris always made fun of black people too. Yeah. So it, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah. And, and and there's a lot of stuff to be. You know, and, and he did it in a way that it wasn't like okay, the comics. You know, the old cliche thing. The difference between cats and dogs. But if you're gonna do a cat and dog joke, have the definitive one. You know, Leno was the king of that. People don't realize what a great comic he was. If you're gonna make a joke about McDonald's or chicken McNuggets, make it or the how best small one. the bathroom yeah. is on an airplane which you know, every comic did in open mic night, Leno would have the joke, you know? Right. You know, so so yeah. if you're going to have a great joke and a, and a smart joke, then it's okay. So would and you have Christmas. to, in other words, today, if you went back on the road, all of a sudden right. now there's no more COVID and uh, clubs are going, you know, it's nostalgia night, let's bring back Bobby Slayton. Right. Would you have an act to do? You know, first of all, I have to remember it because I've worked in a year and a half, you know. Um, People don't understand this, by the way. You can forget your act if you're not doing it every night. Oh, no, you, 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 a million comics have talked about this, and I've heard uh, If you, and at least me personally, mm-hmm. okay, I would work every week, three weeks out of the month. And that was usually Wednesday through Saturday, Thursday through Sunday, three, two to four nights a week. Mm-hmm. And I'd work two or three weeks in a row, take a week off. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and if I took a week off, it would take me one show, one night, to get back into my act. You know, because, you yeah. know, I, and the problem I had, and it was a good problem, one good thing about my act was I never did anything in the same order. I, I would try to have a joke to end with, maybe something to open with, and it would always be the same thing. So a lot of comics would follow a certain order, and I would just be bouncing all over the place because mm-hmm. I'd start talking to some of the audience, mm-hmm. forget where I was, you know, and go on to another topic, maybe try to come back to it, which usually I could, unless it was a second show, and I've already had three or four vodkas, then by the end of the evening, you know, I would sometimes, you know, your memory's not quite sharp. Yeah. But anyway, um, I would still have an act now. Um, it would take me a while to get back into it. You know, the anti-Asian stuff, I would still do the Asian jokes. Um, I would still do the gay jokes. Um, but you know what? All it takes is two or three idiots in the audience to start giving you shit, yeah. you know? Yeah, um, yeah. And it used to be, look, even drunks and bachelorette parties, you try to ignore them and you can't. You know, there are a few comics. I think my friend Nick DiPaolo, yeah. I think he used to have in his contract, no bachelorette parties at my show. And there's been a few well-behaved bachelorette parties, but most of them have been monsters. No, 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 so no, no, I no. think now the generation of millennials who want to change the world, you know, every white yuppie kid with the Black Lives Matter. And, you know, and you find it's a lot of the guys with the man buns who work at Starbucks who are the ones, you know, all of Asian people left the Asian jokes and black people left. But then there's some uptight liberal douchebag white guy who thinks he's an arbiter of taste and yeah. judge for what I well, what I, like. I often said, why is it everybody's upset by black jokes or white? You know? Yeah, uh, no, you basically. Know, uh, yeah. you, usually I found that, uh, uh, you know, you would kid about blacks and, and they liked you. You, you yeah. played very well to a black audience. Well, you, you know, know, it depends how you work it. You know, I play Indian casinos. And, yeah. You know, they've always been very, you know, careful with the Indian jokes. It's an Indian casino. And I remember, you know, whatever jokes I did. And by the way, it's funny that they call them Indian casinos, but they don't like to be called Indians. 
you know, <laughs> whoo, the, the name of your wild park, right, man, but don't close an Indian, you know. Yeah. What did you call a Native American casino? Who are all these people? <laughs> Who are so, yeah, these I, people I think, anyway? I, I think but the thing about stand-up comedy, you have to really want to do it. When it becomes a job, Yeah. Like just a job, well, let me, and it's not fun anymore. Let me say this because we're uh, we're kind of running out of time. This audience is going to hate me for you know not getting to them, but I would rather okay. I would rather talk to you for two hours. <coughs> you know, but yeah. Well, we got to we, we ha- to begin with. We have to do this again sooner than I've said. You know, I really I, I've enjoyed this. You and I just talk. We're just friends. You know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I do say that when people ask me. Who is the best comic you've ever worked with? Bobby Slate. But you know, it's funny. They're you better know. comics now. There are guys that astound me. No, how no, great no, they no, are. no, like, like no, Chris Rock, no, no. Like in, Chappelle, in your like opinion, in your opinion, because you exclude yourself in that uh, in that uh, um, group. But the fact is, Bobby, that when people say to me, "Tell me, uh, 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 tell me a funny comic," I say, "The funniest comic I know, and the best, the best technician." Okay. Is Bobby Slate? Okay, watch watch Bill Burr. I mean, I mean, oh, Bill Burr is incredible, but yeah, you are the best technician. I'm a technician. That's well, no, no, well, but I'm well, saying there's a technique to doing comedy. Yeah, well, I was you good. I, look, you do something for forty years, you better be pretty good at it. But there are guys that I watch, like Jerry Seinfeld, who you know is mind boggling to me. But whatever, it's fine. You know what? It's like baseball. You know, <laughs> there were guys that were better than. And Mickey Mantle, not that I'm the Mickey Mantle mm-hmm. comedy. Man. There are plenty of great, great ball players in baseball, but, but there's by always the way, the two names, 10, 20, 30, 40 guys who are just as good, if not better. The two it's names fine. that come to mind for me are you and Bill Hicks. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's nice. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm serious. But then again, I'm, I'm limiting this to people I've actually worked with. Okay. Yeah, Seinfeld's great. Bill Burr's great. I didn't work with them, I worked right. with you. You know. I would have. Okay, I'm gonna let you go, but I would have liked to see what Bill Hicks would have been doing now. Oh, it's a shame. Yeah, you know? it's really a shame. He was. It's like saying, I like, it's like Jimi Hendrix. What would he be doing now? I mean, but you know. Hey, whatever. listen. Thank you for spending so much time with us, and and uh, stay where you are because of when I'm through doing this, I want to talk to you for a few more seconds. Okay. Wait, wait, I, wait. I, yeah, okay. okay. Just, just stay, then you, just stay uh, online. Okay, we're done. Yeah, I'm okay. just gonna stop recording. Stop recording, and then I, I got to go garden before. I, yeah, well, maybe I we can. Be, yeah, too bad. Even you though it's have... nighttime, I guess I, I don't know if I'm supposed to. Uh, yeah, it's nighttime. Night. It's nighttime here. It's noon in California. You know what you do. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies go and gentlemen, the incredible Bobby Slayton. Thanks, Bobby. Thanks. Thanks, Alex.